Welcome to the Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Hosted by John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to episode 21 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, today we'll be interviewing Nettie Akorafor. She was born in the United States to two Nigerian immigrant parents. Uh, she's a professor at Chicago State University. Uh, though American-born, Nettie's muse is Nigeria. Her parents began taking her and her siblings to visit relatives there when she was very young. Her first novel, Zara the Windseeker, takes place in a highly technological world based on Nigerian myths and culture. Her second novel, The Shadow Speaker, has characters from and takes place in the countries of Niger and Nigeria. And her forthcoming adult novel, Who Fears Death, is a dark, gritty, magical realist novel that combines African literature and fantasy and science fiction. And so actually, I first came across Nettie's work in an anthology that John edited called Seeds of Change. Uh, that featured a story called Spider the Artist, which is set in an African village. And uh, the main character is a, a woman who kind of has an unhappy life. And there's a oil pipeline that runs sort of through her backyard along the outskirts of the village. And nobody in the village is allowed to go near this oil pipeline. And there are kind of creepy spider robots that scuttle up and down the oil pipe to make sure that nobody uh, messes with it. And she kind of develops a the, 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 the main character sort of develops a friendship with one of these robots. It's just a really cool uh, story. But so I wanted to ask John, you know, where, you know, wh where did you first encounter Nettie's work? Yeah, I first uh, encountered her work when The Shadow Speaker came out. Um, at the, around that time, I was, I was doing these interviews for Sci-Fi Wire where I would uh, do a little short interview with an author and do a little profile on their book. I was trying to be as comprehensive as possible. So I was, you know, I was checking out a lot of stuff and, uh, and that was something that I got as a review book. And, uh, I thought it looked interesting and, and very different from, you know, most of the stuff that I seen come across my desk. And, uh, you know, I've always, I've always kind of been interested in, in Africa and, um, and I always kind of wondered why there wasn't more, you know, SF set there. Yeah. So I, I, so I, I found the shadow speaker and then I just, I, I, I interviewed Den Nettie and, uh, she was a really interesting interview, and so when I was go doing Seeds of Change, I, I invited her to write a story, and, and you know she she sent me Spider the Artist, and you know I was just delighted to get it. I mean, it's you know great story as as you were saying. So, um, and, and did you say that the story was the first like straight science fiction story that she had written? Right. Yeah. Um, that was the other thing is that you know previously, uh, or at least as far as I knew, everything she had written was a merger of science fiction and fantasy elements, like The Shadow Speaker, and um, so. When I asked her to write a, a story for Seeds of Change, I, you know, I mean, the idea of the anthology was supposed to be explicitly science fiction, not, you know, not a merger of, of fantasy and science fiction. So, yeah, so I believe that was the first story that she had written that was explicitly science fiction with, with no fantasy elements to it. Oh, and I should mention that Nettie is actually guest of honor at WISCON this year, which is being held May 27th through the 31st in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So if you enjoy the episode and you want to meet Nettie and you're going to be there, uh, be sure to look for her. Also, if you want to meet me, uh, well, I'll be there too. So maybe we'll see you there. All right. And so, I mean, just a lot of really interesting stuff to talk about. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this interview. And then stick around after the interview when John and I will be talking about uh, fantasy and science fiction uh, set in Africa and sort of in using African themes. All right. Let's get Nettie on the phone. Hello. Hi, this is Dave and John from Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Hi, how are you? Good. Thanks for joining us on the show. Uh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, okay, so first of all, when you were growing up, your parents often took you to visit relatives in Nigeria. Uh, what were those trips like, and what are some of the most vivid memories you have of them? They were great, really. They were um, really eye-opening and uh, fun. That's what, I, that's what I remember, especially from the beginning. Um, my parents were taking us back there since before my brother was born. He's seven years younger than me. The first time was about when I was probably about seven, just before he was born. And um, I just remember at that age, it was, you know, you have this rosy view of everything. Everything is just great. Everything is wonderful. Everything, you remember all of the positives, the, the plants, the creatures, your relatives, everyone's smiling and all of that. As I got older, you know, the trips became more complex. You're picking up some of the language, you're picking up some of the culture, you're recognizing a lot of the cultural conflicts and all of that. So um, my trips were very, very nurturing, very nurturing. I guess that's the best way to describe them. How did you get interested in writing and what sort of early writing did you do? I never wrote anything creatively. I, I wrote no fiction until 
I think, until I was about 19 or 20, until my sophomore year in college. I never had a class for some reason in high school, never had any creative writing classes, nothing. And what got me interested was, it's really cliche, it was a creative writing course that I was told to take, that someone suggested that I take. And I took that course, and um, once I wrote my very first story, it was, you know, I, I never stopped writing from that point on. I realized that this was what I loved doing and that I was kind of good at telling stories. And the very first story that I wrote was speculative. It was full of weird, magical craziness. So how long did it take you to, from when you started writing until you got published? I went several years without um, even knowing anything about publishing. I come from a very scientific family, you know, we don't do things like that. <laughs> we don't do those artistic things. So it never crossed my mind to get published for about maybe seven or eight years. I was just writing, just writing because I enjoyed writing. And I love to, I, I found that I love telling these long stories within the first semester of taking that creative writing class. By the end of that semester, I had started writing a novel. I didn't know it was a novel, it was just this long story, but um, I just kept writing and writing and writing, and then I went on to write another novel, and then another novel, and then another novel, So, and, and I wasn't even thinking about getting any of them published. I just was writing them because I loved stories. What was really good about that is that because I was not thinking about getting published, I had this freedom to kind of explore, and there was not that pressure of, oh, am I good enough? Is this really worth something? I just was doing it for the love, and I'm glad I had that time period because, you know, when you start getting published, things change a little, but hmm. yeah. <laughs> you list uh, Octavia Butler and Stephen King and Philip Pullman as some of your influences. Uh, could you talk a little bit about those authors and what impact they've had on you? Um, well, Philip Pullman, for one, his I loved his uh, his Dark Materials series, and it was because he was mixing all of these themes into this fantasy story. The story was so vivid, and the story was what pulled me along with those themes, and that that was kind of what I learned from Pullman: how to write a story that was that had something to say, but that didn't overtake the story. At least I don't think it did. When I read that series, I loved it for the story that it told and for the characters that it presented, first and foremost. The other stuff came secondary. Stephen King is just a grand old storyteller. I just, I, I love his stories. I love the way he tells stories. I love just, he has that gift, and I respect that. Octavia Butler, her stories are just absolutely incredible. She was the first to show me that you could write these characters of color in the way that she was doing, and and. That's something that was really pivotal for me because I discovered Octavia pretty late. It was when I was in Clarion. I was in Clarion. I had never read Octavia Butler. That's, that's a terrible <laughs> thing, but that's the, that's the truth. And um, we were, I was in the bookstore one day in the fantasy and science fiction section, and her book, Wild Seed, caught my eye. I'm walking through the bookstore, and I see this book, and it wasn't because of her name that it caught my eye. It was because of the woman on the cover. It was this dark-skinned, African-looking, very intense-looking woman on the cover, and that was what caught my eye, and that was why I bought the book. <laughs> there was no other reason, and when I read it, I was like, oh, my God, I, I need to read every single thing this woman has written. That was like an introduction that I needed so much at that time because it showed me someone else doing something that I was doing. It, was, it wasn't exactly what I was doing, but her characters kind of reminded me of some of the characters that I was writing, and she was doing it really well. And also, another thing about Octavia is her writing style is, is clean, sparse, no mm. nonsense. I love that. Oh, you know, Wild Seed is a great introduction. Um, when I read that, I was like, this is one of the best novels I've ever read, period. I mean, yes. it is so amazing. I mean, I couldn't believe it, like how great it was. And I mean, yes. even even having read other stuff by her, I mean, so she had a very high bar. But I mean, man, that was like, that was something else. Yeah, that was just uh, some great storytelling. And then it mixed in the whole theme of slavery. And then it pulled it across generations because she had mm -hmm. two immortal characters. So you got to see slavery from two points of view, consistent points of view, over hundreds of years, that was like, wow. And then mm -hmm. she's mixing in gender and all this other stuff. I was blown away. It was awesome, yeah. So you mentioned the Clarion Writers Workshop. Uh, could you talk about what your experience was like at that? Oh, my experience at Clarion was, was incredible because at that time I was at a crossroads. I was trying to decide whether I wanted to become a reporter or really seriously go towards 
creative writing. And at that point, I had not decided, or I didn't really understand that I was writing speculative fiction. I didn't really know what it was, and I had an idea, but I've never paid attention to categories. I've always read whatever's good, it, whether it's science fiction or literary realism, whatever, I'll read it if it's good. So that was what I came from. So I didn't have that identification with the genre. And so it was Nell Hopkinson who told me about Clarion. She said, oh, you, oh, you, should, you should apply to that. So I applied to Clarion, and then I also applied for this internship at the Chicago Sun-Times. And so I was, went through this really elaborate interviewing process at the Sun-Times. And I remember Mary Mitchell, who's this well-known columnist there, she was the one kind of pulling me into that at the time. So going through that, and then I'm waiting for my application from Clarion. And it was basically fate that decided it. Because what happened was when I went for the interview at the Sun-Times, I, it was like two, three-hour interviews, first of all. And then also I started talking with the editors about science fiction and fantasy because I told them about Clarion. And one of them said that they knew this woman named Tanana Reeve Du who hmm. worked at some other newspaper like the Atlantic Journal or something like that. And so I kept that name in the back of my head. Then I got into Clarion and I didn't hear back from the Sun-Times. To this day I have no idea why because I went through this huge interviewing process. So yeah, I got into Clarion, ended up going to Clarion. And then knowing about Tanana Reeve Du helped me go and read her work, contacted her, and it was through her that I got my first agent. Mm. So it was weird how all of these things kind of, it was fate that decided it. So when I went to Clarion, that experience, meeting everyone there and seeing all of these really serious writers and everything like that, and then meeting my instructors and listening to them and being part of that kind of workshop, which is a very different kind of workshop compared to the ones that you'll find in universities, very different you know, that was where I realized, okay, this is what I'm writing, and these are the people who I have something in common with. So that was a real eye-opening experience for me. So I, I credit Clarion for a lot. Uh, what do you mean that Clarion is different from university courses? I mean, could you put your finger on that? Well, first of all, okay, there's the issue within academia of there's a stigma against science fiction and fantasy. I remember when I started my master's and PhD program, one of the first things my creative writing instructor for my novel writing workshop said was, you cannot bring science fiction or fantasy to this workshop. That was the first thing she said. And at the time, you know, this was after Clarion for me, so I, I knew what I was doing. I knew what I was writing. I understood what it was called. And I was just thinking, everything that I write is bad. <laughs> what am I going to bring in? So that was the, my first taste of that weird little stigma against science fiction and fantasy in, in academia and science. It's more of an issue of ignorance on the part of the professors. They have not read the material that they're criticizing. So in Clarion, it's, of course, it's accepted that this is okay to write this kind of stuff, and we are going to view it as good literature, and we're going to critique it that way, and we're going to teach you techniques that will help you write better. And the writing instruction is at the same level as within academia. Uh, so among the authors who have influenced you, you also mentioned Tuve Janssen and Guji Wa Tiango, uh, who I guess are less familiar names to most of our listeners. Could you tell us a little bit about those authors and how they've influenced you? The Moomin books, I came across those books when I was a kid. Those were the first novels that I had ever read. It's about the Moomins who are like bipedal hippos, <laughs> kind <laughs> of, you know, really cute, plump, very polite hippos. I, at the time, I would read everything, and subconsciously, I, I'm, when I think back, I know I was pretty aware of this, but I just didn't articulate it. I was reading a lot of fantasy and a lot of science fiction, and I wasn't seeing reflections of myself, and I was subconsciously aware of that, not consciously aware of it. So I started migrating to books that featured animals you know, where the main characters were not even human, so I didn't have to deal with that whole racial thing, that they were animals, and the Moomin books were there, and those just uh, attracted me, and, and they were full of these this strange magic, and not just strange, it was like nonsensical almost. You know, you have a hat where water gets in it, and these creatures start coming out, various kinds of creatures that make no sense with strange names like I think one of them was the Hattie Fat Fatners or something like that, you know, and I, I love that. I love the nonsense of it. I loved the strange creatures. So that's how the Moomin books influenced me. Googie Wathiango, uh, he's a Kenyan author, and he's one of my favorite authors. One, I love his writing format. He writes very clean 
prose also, and he's like this grand storyteller. He can weave these stories, and on top of that, he weaves in, in a lot of his stuff, especially a lot of his more recent stuff, he weaves in politics, Kenyan politics, some serious politics, and he was involved in a lot of the political movement back in the day and even now. But aside from the politics, he weaves in sorcery in this way that they call it magical realism. I don't call it that. I just call it, it's fantasy. It, it's, it's fantasy. It's, it's whatever. You know, it's good. I, I enjoy it. And my favorite book that he's written to date is Wizard of the Crow. And that has everything. It's huge. It's like over a thousand pages. And he also has really strong female characters. There are few African male writers that care about that. And I appreciate that. He has them as not just someone's mother or someone's girlfriend who is not central to the plot and whose plight only matters because they're connected to the main character or whatever, or what they can do for the main character, but they're real entities. And they're main characters, too. So in Wizard of the Crow, that book just had everything. It had every element that I look for in writing, all in one book. So your first two novels were Zara the Windseeker and the Shadow Speaker. Could you tell us a little bit about those and how you came to write them? Zara the Windseeker was the only book that I've written where I knew the beginning, the middle, and the end. I got the whole thing in one big chunk, mainly. You know, there were little chapters that I added near the end, but I knew that story. The first part that came to me about Zara was, of course, was pretty obvious if you read it, <laughs> is the Greeny Jungle. That jungle, I had written a whole novel about that jungle before I wrote Zara. And that was where I discovered the cultures there and most of the creatures there and all of that. So I knew it really, really, really well. And when I finished that book, this was during the time, that seven, eight-year period where I was just writing, just writing because I was writing. So when I sat down to write Zara, I knew that jungle. And I knew that I had this girl character and I wanted her to go in that jungle. I didn't write it as a young adult book. I just wrote it, and the main character just happened to be 13 years old, and she just happened to have a 13-year-old friend who happened to be a boy. And so all those elements eventually came together to become Zara the Windseeker. And I had written another book before that also about another Windseeker woman, not a girl, who was a lot meaner, a lot more violent, <laughs> And far more promiscuous. And so I knew about the Windseeker myth, too. So that wasn't the first time I was dealing with that. So Zara was like just another part of this grand story I've been telling myself. The Shadow Speaker, yeah, it was also another part of another novel, another novel that I had written before that. I had written a novel about a character that a lot of people have always liked, the Ja character, who is the woman that E.G. goes after the woman who kills E.G.'s father in the very beginning of the book. I'd written about her, you know, her origins and how she came out to be this wild woman <laughs> that she is. So when I finished that book, I realized that I wanted to know a little more about the Ja character. And the way I, I realized I wanted to learn about her was through this other character who I'd written, who was E.G., who was the main character of the Shadow Speaker. So that's how that came along. So all these stories are all connected. They're all part of this bigger thing that I've been doing. That novel, The Shadow Speaker, won the Carl Brandon Parallax Award. Could you talk a bit about that award? The Carl Brandon Parallax Award is one of two awards given to writers of color. I think the Kindred Award is the best fiction by a writer of color that deals directly with issues of race. And then the Parallax Award is just like a general, um, the best uh, speculative fiction by a writer of color. And yeah, I was very honored to win uh, the Carl Brandon Parallax Award. You also have two other new novels coming out, Akata Witch and Who Fears Death. Uh, wh so what are these books about, and how different is it writing a YA book versus an adult book? Okay, I'll start with, with Who Fears Death. Who Fears Death, okay, so that's my first published <laughs> adult novel. It's about a woman who does something so problematic that she ends up in jail awaiting her execution in two days and it takes place in a futuristic Africa. It's basically her story and what happened. The difference between writing a young adult and an adult book, in my experience, and I don't know if it's just because of the nature of the stories, but Who Fears Death was far more painful and disturbing to write. I didn't experience any nightmares <laughs> writing Zara or The Shadow Speaker or Akata Witch, 
but who fears death? I experienced plenty of nightmares, plenty of times. It was a very difficult book to write, but that might be just because of the nature of the story. It's, it's a rough story, so there's that. There are examples of young adult literature where there is very sensitive material in the, in there, but I think the majority of young adult literature, the sensitive material is dealt with with the idea in mind that younger people are reading this, so therefore you write it in that way. When you're writing adult fiction, you don't have that safety net. When I wrote uh, Who Fears Death, there are several scenes in there where if I was writing this for young adults, either I wouldn't have included those scenes or I would have toned them down a lot. And so when I was able to just kind of stretch out and write what was really there, it was a far more disturbing experience for me, but I also it, there, there was a sort of freedom that I experienced when allowed to just write what was really there when I came to that kind of scene. So besides being a writer, you're also a professor at Chicago State. Um, what classes do you teach and how has being a teacher affected your writing? Um, I teach creative writing courses and um, literature courses and some journalism courses too and some film too. I love teaching and if I was not a professor and I was just, let's say, a full-time writer, I think I would go mad <laughs> because I am a very disciplined writer and I, I am inundated constantly with ideas. And if I just had the time to just sit and write all the time, I know I would and I wouldn't take a break. And hmm. a lot of times coming to the university and then dealing with students and being able to give back and being able to impart what I've learned along the way it's refreshing to do. It's, it's very healthy for someone like me, as opposed to just being in my own head all the time. And then a lot of times during the writing workshops, it's like the, sometimes I'll learn from the students. It's, it's a give and take kind of thing. I'm teaching the students, but a lot of times they're teaching me, which is refreshing too. And we have some great, great, great discussions in my classes. It's, it's really, I really enjoy that. So it has a balancing effect, I think. Uh, so you grew up wanting to be an entomologist. Uh, could you give us some examples of how this interest has expressed itself in your writing? Oh, yeah. I mean, like in everything that I write, you're going to see creatures. I love insects. I love the fact that they are just everywhere. I love the fact that they outnumber human beings, that they are more resilient than human beings, and they're in everything, and they're forever present, and they're just watching. They are watching, and, they are, <laughs> and, and then they have their own societies, and they're doing their own thing and all that. I love that. A lot of times, you know, you'll find that in my work. You'll find insects in my work, um, Spiders. I'm, I'm terrified of spiders. You know, I know those are arachnids, but I'm terrified <laughs> of spiders. And because of that, you'll find lots of spiders in my work. Insects are fascinating. The way they are, their bodies and what they can do, absolutely fascinating. So sometimes I'll put them in my stories and I'll make them really, really huge, you know, just <laughs> so I can see and listen to them. And like in my, um, in my story, uh, uh, The Lost Diary of Tree Frog, was it Tree Frog 8 or Tree Frog? One of those. That, I think it was 7. short story. Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a giant wingless sphinx moth. I love sphinx moths. They're just so cool. <laughs> they're like birds, if you've ever seen them. They're like, they look like hummingbirds. You would think they're hummingbirds. So in this one, I got rid of its wings and, and made it have issues <laughs> and very much enjoyed that. You know, in most of my work, actually all of my work, you're going to see creatures like that. Uh, so what are your impressions of the way that science fiction deals with Africa, and what are some of the things that authors get right and get wrong? There are some authors who deal with Africa really well. Alan Dean Foster is one of them. He, he does a really good job with that. He has this way of viewing the continent and various countries within the continent as places that exist in present time. I like that. But too often I see... Africa presented in a way of like it's it's either a, a place that is exotic and that that is used as an exotic setting where you know it's used as opposed to being shown from the inside also I get tired of seeing Africa presented as a place of the past that really irks me I mean I know a lot of its history is yet to be told and a lot of its history is yet to be celebrated yes it's understood but it is also a place that still exists <laughs> you know it's a place that's still moving forward into the future and so that was what made me start writing about it in the first place because first and foremost I am a reader I love reading 
And when I was reading, I was not seeing any portrayals of Africa that really satisfied me. So, you know, my mother says the best way to get something done is to do it yourself. So that's what I started doing. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just feel like when it is portrayed, which is very rare, it's either portrayed as a place that other people visit, that other people go to, and other people are like, oh, look at how, look at the people and how wonderful they are. They smile and they're so happy to see us. And, yeah, they're so fascinated by us, you know, that kind of outsider perspective or it's portrayed as a place of the past. And I, I want to see it portrayed as a place of the present because it's, there's so much going on over there on so many levels. Also, it's portrayed as a place of war, disease, uh, and poverty. And that's it. Like, nobody smiles there and has their own life going on there. And, and that is not true. Of course, the continent has issues, but, you know, there's still people still live their lives over there. And so I would like to see more of that, too. I'd like to see more of people from there being portrayed from within, from a, a knowledgeable perspective from within. I, I want to see, I want to hear the natives. I want to hear their voices a lot more, mm. authentically so, not in a, a way that's super nice, you know, to the point where you don't portray any of the negatives, but I don't want to see complete negative. I just, I want realism. That's what, that's what I'd like to see. And I don't see enough of that. How popular is science fiction and fantasy in Africa? They like the movies, at least from mm. my perspective, it's strictly Nigerian. So that's what I'm talking When I talk about what I see in Africa, that's typically what I'm talking about. And from what I've seen, yeah, they like the movies. They like the Hollywood movies. They get those on bootleg, you know, and, and they, they like that. In terms of literature, there's so little literature available, it's so hard for people to find stuff there. That's part of the problem, too. I think if there were more publishing companies that could make money and that could survive, that would definitely help and make the books available. Even classics like Things Fall Apart and a lot of Googie Wathiango stuff there, you'll go in the market and you'll see photocopied <laughs> versions mm. being sold. Like, who's going to make money off of that and how is that going to help anything? So it's a deep issue. It's, it's a harder issue to solve than one would think. It's not just an issue of, okay, presenting the material to them. It's like you got to have publishing houses too, and you got to have people being able to buy the books. And then there is a, a culture of reading, but not. it's not like in the West, I guess you could say. So there are all sorts of issues to hurdle. I think the first way to hurdle the issue is that Nollywood needs to start making some science fiction films. That would be a good way to get people to start opening their minds to science fiction. Yeah, we were going to ask you about Nollywood. Uh, you know, there, it's for people who don't know, it's, it's uh, you know, the burgeoning film industry of Nigeria. Um, so could you tell us uh, a little bit about it and what Nigerian movies, uh, you know, Americans might be able to get their hands on and check out? Or Yeah, Nollywood is Nigerian film industry. It is the second largest film industry in the world. Bollywood is first. Nollywood is second. Nollywood is an N, Nigeria, and then um, Hollywood is third. And that's in terms of the number of movies put out by filmmakers. Of course, <laughs> the quality and the budgets are nothing like, you know, American Hollywood films, of course. So, and the way they make the films is you would be amazed that the films even look as nice as they do because they are working under some adverse conditions. I mean, there are issues where they won't have electricity even to shoot. <laughs> After learning so much about the Nollywood industry and seeing how they do it and how fast they do it and how fast they write that stuff and get it out and then they have to fight the pirates, it's like, wow, it's, it's really quite amazing. My favorite director is uh, Chidi Chikere, and that's spelled um, T-C-H-I-D-I, -I, and then his last name is C-H-I-K-E-R-E. -E. But my favorite film of his, I guess, would be... Hmm, I have a lot of them, but <laughs> Beautiful Soul and Stronger Than Pain. Those two are some of his best. He's, he has a lot of good ones. He's good. And then, let's see, there's another, I can't remember the director, but the film was called Warrior's Heart. And I love that film because it was about this warrior woman who, she was the chief of her, or whatever you call it, chiefess of her village, and she had magical powers, and they had like, it was like, it was fantasy. It was fantasy, and it was really cool. So um, that one, Warrior's Heart, a lot of these, 
you can see on YouTube, but the quality mm. is really bad. You want to actually get the DVDs. And you can get the DVDs. There are some online places, but a lot of places like – I know there's a nice African film store in um, – Washington, D.C., I forget what it's called. But there, if there's like an African restaurant or a place where you have a lot of immigrants, African immigrants, they sell the movies there. And a lot of the movies I've mentioned are, are probably at these kinds of places. So that's, that's where you would get them. And there are some on Amazon, too. There are a few on Amazon. Okay, so is there anything else you have out or that you're working on that you'd like people to know about? My next young adult novel, Akata Witch, that one comes out in 2011, and that one is um, that one is crazy. <laughs> it's it's set in in present day Nigeria, and it's got like some of the craziest witchcraft and juju that I've ever written about, and it, it's it makes me laugh that this book is going to be published because <laughs> one I think is great, but it's crazy. The main character is a girl named Sunny. And she is albino. She's Igbo. Uh, well, she was born in the United States, but they took her and her brothers back. They moved back to Nigeria when she's nine. And so, so she's American, and then she's Nigerian, and then she's albino. So she has, like, all of these cultural things that are just um, – that she's going to be plagued with because of what she is. She's got, like, a lot of identity issues, and she's – very feisty and she gets in some fights and, and those are great to write but um so yeah so she's the main character and basically it's about how she learns that she is part of something really big and how she deals with that it, it's a fun but there's some scary stuff in there but it's a, it's a fun novel and then uh this one's funny i also did a chapter book for the disney fairies series and uh, it's called Iridessa and the Fire-Bellied Dragon Frog. And Iridessa is one of the African fairies in the Disney Fairies series. So I hmm. that. <laughs> I'm basically all over the place. It's, 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 uh, it's just me. And, and you write short stories as well, right? And the, yes, I have um, a few short stories um, coming out. Let's see. Um, I have one in... Um, Jonathan Strand's young adult anthology, Life on Mars. Yeah, I have a short story called Wahala in that one, which is my first short story that I've written with an alien in it. Mm. And yeah, that was fun. And then I have a story in The Way of the Wizard. And um, what is that story called? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the Go the, Slow. The Go, the go Slow. slow. Yeah, I have, yeah, I have that story coming out in The Way of the Wizard. So yeah, a few short stories. I'm doing my thing with that, too, yeah. Uh, and your website is the Wahala Zone. <laughs> yes, Wahala means trouble. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I've been known to cause trouble in my day, and it just seemed like a very appropriate name. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay, well, Nettie Akorafor, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Thanks for having me. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Nettie Akorafor for joining us on the show. Uh, so right at, the, right at the end there, Nettie was mentioning that her story, The Ghost Slow, is going to be appearing in The Way of the Wizard, which is an anthology, actually, that John is editing. Uh, so I was wondering, you know, John, do you want to maybe talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure. You know, it's, a, it's an anthology of a story about wizards, as the title implies. Um, it's a mix of reprints and originals. Uh, it's probably, you know, 60% or so original, 40% uh, reprint. You know, just uh, the goal of the anthology was to sort of get as many different takes on The Wizard as, as I could. Instead of having, you know, 30 stories about Gandalf, you know, by a different name, you know, my goal was to, to find, a, you know, as much variety as possible. So, and, you know, Nettie's story is, is certainly unique amongst uh, the stories that I purchased so for, for the anthology. Could you say who any of the authors are going to be? Uh, yeah, so um, it's going to have original stories by, well, Mr. David Barr Kirtley, <laughs> uh, C.C. Finley, uh, David Farland, uh, Jeffrey Ford, let's see, Lev Grossman, Simon R. Green, um, Cinda Williams Chima. There's reprints by Peter Beagle, Neil Gaiman, George R. R. Martin, um, and people like that. Uh, you know, Susanna Clark and Ursula K. Le Guin. I think it's kind of a good mix of uh, you know old and new stories as well as uh, sort of veteran and uh, new writers as well. Okay, and so Nettie was also mentioning that Alan Dean Foster is an author who does, you know, who sort of handles Africa well. So uh, it looks like he has a novel called Carnivores of Light and Darkness. I assume this is a uh, sort of a nod to Roger Zelazny's Creatures of Light and Darkness. 
but there's a I came across a sort of a, a review of it that kind of describes it a little bit. It sounds really interesting. I'll just read this quickly. The tall herdsman slash warrior Ejole Ihamba of the Naumkib tribe lives by the sea. When a number of strange warriors wash up dead on the sand, only the nobleman Taren Beckwith survives long enough to whisper a dying request. It seems that the visionist Thamaro of Wakanda has been abducted by Heimneth the Possessed and carried off to the remote land of El Laramar. Ejole accepts the dead man's entreaty to rescue her and sets off on a very long journey. Ejole speaks the languages of animals, his bearing is courteous, his aspect modest and reasonable, and he solves problems by negotiation. A friendly snake provides him with an immunity to poison. He acquires a sidekick, the garrulous treasure hunter Simna ibn Sind. He outraces a sentient tornado to save Alita, a large black cat. Finally, after various adventures involving floating ponds, dolphins, tiny warriors, a hostile animated sand dune, the mirage palace of a soul eater, and a gigantic walking wall, he's menaced by the evil light-eating Aero Makati. <laughs> so it sounds like there's lots of stuff going on in that book. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've read other stuff by Alan Dean Foster, and, and he is a writer that sort of does seem to really do other cultures well. Uh, I haven't read any of his stuff dealing with Africa, not that I can recall, but I, I've read other stories by him that you know deal with uh, different cultures, and uh, and that was something I always you know thought he excelled at. Uh, but also during the interview, we were talking about Octavia Butler's Wild Seed, and you were talking about how much you enjoyed it. I was wondering if you could maybe just tell people a little bit about what the story is and. Sure. Um, so there's there's basically two main characters in the story. One is this guy named Doro who can uh, survive the death of his body by transferring his essence into the body of another, um, which actually we could have mentioned in uh, episode 19 when we were talking about consciousness transference. But when he takes over the body, there's only there's only room for one consciousness in the in the human brain. So when he takes control, the, the other person gets kicked out. And, uh, you know, this guy has survived this way for thousands of years, hopping from body to body. And uh, but he can't he can't stay in a body for for very long. So he has to keep jumping from body to body. And then this. So that's sort of the backstory. And then this, uh, the novel begins in, in 1690 in Africa. Um, and Doro discovers another immortal by the name of Ayanwu. But she's not the same sort of person as he is, but she does have powers. And and so instead of stealing new bodies, she's like able to manipulate her body to heal any wound or to make herself appear forever young or to shape change into different creatures and stuff like that. And so when they meet, she appears to be like this old woman serving as a shaman to a village. But then he discovers like what she really is. And and he sort of he embarks on this quest to find other people like her, which he calls Wild Seed, people who are out in the wild with uh, powers and uh, and then and then it's just it becomes this sort of multi generational genetic engineering project. You know, not in the scientific not in the scientific sense of like actually gen, you know genetic engineering that way, but like you know selective breeding and whatnot in order to uh, you know sort of help foster these people who have these abilities. And uh, so it starts in Africa in 1690, and then it's sort of the story goes all the way up um, you know into the American colonies and, and beyond that. It's an amazing book, and I really can't recommend it highly enough. Now, lest anyone get scared off from it, uh, because it's it's part of a series. It, it's part of the series called the Pattern Master series, and it's not the first one written. It's like number four, I think. But you don't actually need to read any of the others to read Wild Seed because it's the first chronologically. So while she wrote it fourth, it actually takes place in the series first. So it's a great place to jump in, and um, you know, I mean, it's I think it's her best book. I, I haven't actually read all of her novels, but I mean, it's it's the best one of hers I've read, and I've really loved a lot of them. Uh, you know, when I, I mentioned to my mom that we were going to be talking about science fiction dealing, dealing with Africa, she said, oh, you have to talk about Ray Bradbury's story, The Velt, because this is just such a, a great, memorable story. It appeared in his collection, The Illustrated Man, and The Illustrated Man has one of the best framing narrative devices anyone ever came up with. Uh, there's this frame story that uh, the main character kind of meets. He's kind of um, you know, sort of sleeping along the side of the road, and he meets a fellow traveler, and this guy has his entire body tattooed. And this is the illustrated man. And, and he relates that he had been injured, sort of injured on the job and had to lie in bed for, you know, a long period of time while he was convalescing. And he had decided to get his whole body tattooed just to have something to do. But the person he got a, he, he got these tattoos from ended up being some sort of witch from the future. And she had given him, given him kind of these weird magical tattoos. And he warns the, the main character not to look at any of the, any of the tattoos while, while he's asleep because bad things happen to people who look at these tattoos. But uh, the guy can't help himself, and so he looks at each of these tattoos. And when he looks at each each tattoo that he looks at, it kind of comes to life and tells a story. And so the stories within the Illustrated Man are the stories that these tattoos tell. Uh, but so the Velt is, I think it's maybe the first story. It's 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 one of the most memorable. But it's about a uh, family, and they buy this fancy new technological house, 
And one of the features of this house is that it has a, a so-called playroom, which is kind of like the holodeck from Star Trek, where you can just kind of program the room to contain whatever you want it to. And the kids become obsessed with recreating the African veldt. And uh, it just becomes sort of spookier and spookier. And they can see lions off in the distance feasting on prey that they've taken down. And the parents start to worry that the kids are developing a sort of morbid obsession with, with the veldt. And they try to program it to go away, but it seems to keep coming back. And it's just, it's just a really cool, creepy story. Last episode, I was talking about Mike Resnick's Kiran Yaga. And so I want to say a little bit more about that because that's certainly, you know, science fiction dealing with Africa. And so in this, it's a ser- it's also, that's also actually a series of short stories that are linked. And I think actually he, he wrote the first one for an Orson Scott Card anthology, if mm-hmm. I'm remembering correctly, where it was, uh, it was supposed to be all utopia, you know, different kinds of utopias was the theme. And one of the rules that was established was that all the utopias had to be places where it was kind of voluntary to be there and you could leave at any time. And so, so Mike Resnick kind of started thinking about that that rule and decided to do a sort of uh, a utopian community that that is really distressed by what's happened in the future with the environment and with overpopulation and wants to return to a simpler way of life and so decides to reconstitute a kind of tribal existence on a terraformed world. So, and uh, so in each story, some something happens that causes the community to question their commitment to really sticking to the old ways and the main character uh Koroba he's 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 the most committed to you know to to not compromising this vision in any way and so he he's constantly sort of scheming to to keep the rest of the people from from going from going astray and and he tells stories sort of folk stories and so there's kind of these stories within a story and the stories themselves are told kind of in a sort of folk tale kind of voice uh and um, you know these stories have won all kinds of awards. They're they're really really interesting. It's it's the series that has won the most awards in like the history of science fiction or something like that. And the book it has just a beautiful cover that I love, where you see sort of an African village and then this gigantic sort of spaceship, you know, in the sky in the background. Yeah, you know, actually, if I'm unless I'm mistaken, I think that that Orson Scott Card anthology actually never came through. It never came together. And uh, Resnick actually, I believe, published the first one in FNSF. Because when I when I when I was reading about that, I was kind of like I was like I was thinking like oh well I need to go read that anthology, but then I learned that oh, oh, well oh it actually never got published. So, um, but at least it produced something like uh, Karen Yaga. Yeah, and so you know speaking of Mike Resnick, uh, he has this anthology uh, he co-edited with Gardner Dozois called Future Earths Under African Skies, and um, it's a reprint anthology. It's a you know mass market. Um, you know it's. It's out of print. I mean, you'd have to buy it used, but it's, uh, let's see, it's about 15 stories or so that are like sort of the best uh, stories dealing with, you know, SF um, in Africa, you know, according to the editors, obviously. But um, it's got people like, well, you know, it's got a, it's got one of the Kiran Yaga stories in it um, called Four I Have Touched the Sky. And uh, then it's got stories by Werner Vinge and Howard Waldrop and uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, Gregory Benford um, and Ian McDonald and, oh, and Bruce Sterling. So, and, and you know, some others as well. And uh, I thought it was really interesting. Um, in the introduction to the book, Resnick actually talks about how out of all of the solar systems and all of the galaxies in the universe where SF writers could set their stories, a full 10 percent of the Hugo winning stories, you know, at the time when he calculated this in the 90s uh, were set in Africa. I, I, I will I will point out one other um, author in the book that maybe people aren't as familiar with, but the the author M. Shane Bell. He's written several stories about about Africa, and and you know I haven't read them all, but I mean the ones I've read, and including the one in the anthology. I mean I I, I definitely think that he is one of the better writers who who does do it well and and, and seems to do it right. And I don't believe they've ever been collected into anything. But uh, in the in the header note for the story, it actually says that that this story in the book is a, is one of a loosely a loosely connected series of stories about life in a future Africa. And uh, he plans to you know sort of turn it into a novel. I'm not sure that that actually ever came out, but. You know, if uh, if you're interested in, in, you know, this sort of fiction, I mean, definitely pick up, you know, look for the anthology and then, you know, possibly like, you know, try to track down M. Shane Bell's other stories. Um, OK, I mean, well, when I think about sort of fantasy and Africa, uh, I, I think about this novel, She by H. Ryder Haggard. I read this back in college um, and it's really stuck with me. I think H. Ryder Haggard is best known for King Solomon's Minds and the character Alan Quatermain. If you saw um, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, that was the the Sean Connery character in that movie, which you know is maybe not the best recommendation, but huh. uh, 
But so the same author, he also wrote a novel called She, which is, is really sort of a classic in this colonial adventure genre. And it does have some of some of the kind of drawbacks you would expect from a book written from a colonial perspective. But it is, I found it very readable, and it is a very memorable story. Uh, but so there are these scholars, and one of the main characters is kind of a stout, not particularly attractive guy. And he has a, a, a younger friend who's just this gorgeous, sweet, handsome guy. And so they come across a manuscript that leads them to sort of seek treasure in Africa, and they get captured by uh, by natives and taken before uh, a sort of queen that the natives worship, named Aisha, who it turns out is a an Egyptian queen who has you know who is centuries old and well, you know always wears a mask. And so it turns it turns out that this gorgeous young guy is the reincarnation of of her lover who died centuries ago, and she's been waiting for him to be reborn. And so the secret of her immortality is that there's this sort of fire within this mountain. And if you step into the fire, it makes you immortal. And so she wants him to become immortal and join her forever. And he's not sure. <laughs> he's not sure about stepping into the whole fire thing. Hmm. Um, but one really memorable part of the book for me was that she's, you know, the most beautiful woman who ever lived. And she tells this kind of ugly <laughs> guy that she'll let him look at her face if, if he really wants to. But uh, she strongly cautions against it because... He'll sort of be haunted by her beauty for the rest of his life and always mm. regret having looked at her face. And he says mm-hmm. he wants to look at it. And, and so that's exactly what happens. You know, he, mm-hmm. he spends the rest of his life sort of haunted by this, this vision of, of beauty that he's seen. And, uh, you know, I, c- I can really see why it became a bestseller. I mean, it is very, uh, it's a page turner, which is not always the case with books you're assigned to read in college. Hmm. Or but, books that are like 100 years old. Yeah, yeah. Recently, when you think about science fiction in Africa, what comes to mind is this movie District 9, which is uh, what it was produced by Peter Jackson, mm-hmm. and it's set in Johannesburg, South Africa. And it's sort of about aliens, sort of an alien ship arrives and kind of hovers in the sky over the city. And the aliens uh, have advanced technology, but all the survivors from the ship don't really know how to use or make the technology, and they kind of become a um, sort of a ghetto uh, in the city. This was a very well-received movie i i I think it it's gotten good reviews it's like 90 percent on rotten tomatoes it actually it just won the bradbury award um you know which is the uh it's the it's the new award that sifwa gives out to um to movies and you know they used to give a nebula award out for best uh screenplay but now they've changed it to the the bradbury award so it just won um you know this weekend so yeah so i mean it's gotten all this acclaim i think neither john or i were all that enamored with it Right. Uh, I guess before we tear into it, I was just going to... Uh, I'll say some of the things I did did like about it. I mean, I, the special effects were fantastic, I thought. Like, the aliens really... You know, you could tell they were CG, but it was, it was just... It's getting to the point where, you know, you can pretty much ignore that it's CG and just kind of, you know, mm-hmm. enjoy the story and, and go with it. And that, um, that like, mechanized... The, the sort of um, yeah. mo- mobile armor suit that he wears at the end. I mean, that thing looked fantastic. It looked so real. That was certainly the best use of mecha in a movie that I'd ever seen at that point. I mean, um, I mean, I think we just saw Iron Man two, and that certainly eclipses it. But you know, that that was the you know the coolest sort of use of that sort of futuristic technology that I'd ever seen depicted on film. And so that was it was certainly you know that was one of its high points. And and the alien weaponry too, like <laughs> I guess just being an old school first person shooter player, you know, <laughs> it was kind of cool to see like, oh hey, it's the lightning gun. You yeah, know? yeah, and it looked very real. You know, when they just blow guys into puddles of boiling blood. You know, using mm-hmm. these things and that mecha suit actually it had essentially all the stuff from Half Life Two. It essentially had the the grav gun from Half Life Two. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. So all that kind of all the technology was all pretty cool. The other thing I, I actually I think you you didn't really like the main character, right? I, I thought he oh, yeah I, I thought but... he was a good actor. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't think it's easy to like act that you're being turned into an insect, Mm -hmm. you know? And I thought, I mean, I totally believed that guy, that character, even though I didn't believe essentially anything that happened in the entire story. Mm -hmm. Um, But I thought, I thought that guy did a great job portraying that character. You know, I think he did a pretty good job acting, but I mean, the character is so loathsome. Like, I mean, I don't know. I just, I found him completely unsympathetic. And uh, as the movie went on, like, I just, I found myself not just caring at all what happened to him. And uh, I mean, there's there's like so many like plot holes in the movie that it just jo- drove me crazy. I mean, sort of half the first half of the movie is pretty good, um, which I understand sort of mirrors the the short film that it was based on. Um, you know, because the the first half of the movie is sort of like this documentary. It's sort of shot like a documentary, just sort of sh- showing you around like what life is like in Johannesburg now that the aliens have landed. But then, like sort of halfway through the movie, it, it just it becomes like this 
sort of typical Hollywood action blockbuster. It's uh, and requisitely uh, is dumbed down to Hollywood action movie standards, um, seemingly anyway. I mean, the the story just goes off the rails at that point, and like I, I mean, I just I, I completely lost interest. And uh, and I mean, there's other issues with it too, but I mean, it's it's like Nettie actually has a really good review of it or a really good takedown of it on her blog. Yeah, I mean, basically, I agreed with everything she said about it. But I, I don't remember it being the first half, being the documentary mm-hmm. part. I remember that being sort of a good 25 minutes or something. And I oh, did okay. I did really lo- like that part. I mean, it was really interesting, you know, just sort of the world they created. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, so it's essentially it's that documentary that was the, it was essentially a remake of the, the, short, the original short film. And then they sort of stuck on this thriller story about this, the functionary uh, who, who accidentally sprays himself in the face with alien goo and <laughs> you know, starts turning into an alien. And and that's sort of, it was essentially at the point where he sprays himself in the face was the first thing I didn't believe. Mm-hmm. And, and then essentially nothing that happened in the story after that did, did I believe. Uh, but, and then as you find out what the black goo was and how important it was to the, the Christopher Johnson alien guy, it becomes more and more implausible, you know, that he would just leave it in a, like, wasn't he, he had like had it in a shoe box or something. And mm-hmm. he had it in this container that, you know, you can just accidentally spray it into your face with. Right. And then the guy, you know, like if I accidentally sprayed myself in the face with alien goo and then started like having black stuff coming out of my nostrils, I, I would want to check myself into a, you know, go see, maybe go see the doctor. I'm like, nah, it's probably nothing, you know. <laughs> you know, there's there's something that writers call an idiot plot, which is a, a plot where, you know, you need the character to do, to do a certain thing. But the only way to get them to, to do that stuff is for them to act like a complete idiot you know, in an unbelievable way. And yeah, and a lot of the, 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 the plot really felt felt that way to me. So yeah, so I mean, anyway, there's just I just had a lot of sort of plausibility issues with the the story, and it was a shame because you know the the setting was so interesting and the special effects were so good, and and I thought the acting was was quite good, but just the the way the plot was put together, just I, I found more and more hard to understand as the uh, as the thing went on. And so actually, out of those nebula choices, I think you were saying right that this would have been at the bottom of your list. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely I liked everything more than District Nine yeah. that was on the list. I probably I think I felt the same way. And you just you just sent me this trailer for this movie, P- Poomsy? Yeah, Poomsy. Yeah, so uh, I I saw this online somewhere, and and so I, just, I I was watching the trailer, and and really, I mean, check out this trailer. It's it's really it's really pretty cool. But I believe it's the first sh- uh, science fiction film made in Kenya. You know, it's a short film. It's twenty minutes long. I, I mean, unfortunately, you can't watch it online right now. You can only watch the trailer. But it's a story that takes place in futuristic, futuristic Africa 35 years after World War III, um, which is called The Water War. And um, I mean, I'll just read the little description of it here. Nature is extinct. The outside is dead. Asha lives and works in a muse- as a museum cur- curator in, in one of the indoor communities set up by the Metu Council. When she receives a box in the mail containing soil, she plants an old seed in it and, ste- and seed starts to germinate instantly. Asha appeals to the council to grant her permission to investigate the possibility of life on the outside, but the council denies her exit visa. Asha breaks out of the inside community to go out into the dead and derelict outside to plant a growing seedling and possibly find life on the outside. So, I mean, it seems really cool. It's like this uh, like sort of post-apocalyptic um, setting where, you know, I guess like we've ruined, uh, we've ruined the earth completely and, and everybody has to sort of huddle inside. Um, I mean, it sounds it sounds like a really interesting film, and I, I mean, I'd love to see it. I mean, if you watch the trailer, it's it's really shot very nicely. I mean, it looks great. Uh, there's a, a series by uh, Stephen Barnes that I've I would really want to check out. It sounds really cool. But um, he he wrote a novel called Lion's Blood and a f- sequel called Zulu Heart, and it's set in an alternate 19th century in which Africa is the dominant world power. You know, and in Europe is still kind of a tribal backwater. And Viking raiders actually sort of kidnap people from the European continent and sell them to slave traders. So there's actually, in, in the New World, there's actually sort of a ruling uh, class of Africans, and then they have European slaves. I was just, I was just reading um, on Wikipedia, they talk about the, the backstory or the, the sort of history that he developed. You know, in our episode with Dan Carl, and he was talking about, you know, alternate history and speculative history. And, and it's just this fascinating backstory for this this world you know just like going back to socrates and it looks like the big turning point was that uh the punic wars went differently and an alliance between carthage and egypt ended up completely wiping rome off the map and that that's you know set the stage for a, a completely different distribution of power yeah you know stephen barnes actually has another book uh, relevant to the topic as well called uh, great sky woman um it's basically clan of the cave bear but set in africa 
you know, I interviewed him about this a while back, and uh, he he sort of described it. Um, you know, he described it that way, and then said uh, it tells the story of two very special people. The first, fully modern human beings. One is Takori, uh, which means nameless, a brilliant, intuitive medicine woman of the Ibandi people who live in the shadow of Kilimanjaro. The other is Frog Hopping, whose capacity for abstraction and logical thought places him in a class of his own. Together, they face the greatest threat their people have ever known, and are the first human beings to cl- climb Kili with the intention of communing with their ancient gods. And, uh, you know, I mean, the idea of like Clan of the Cave Bear basically set in Africa, I mean, that's just like a great, I don't know, elevator pitch to sort of sum it up. And I mean, that's, I mean, you know, how could you not want to read that? But actually, you know, uh, years ago, I attended Orson Scott Card's uh, literary boot camp. And one of, you know, sort of one of his I- ideas is that writers just spend too much time talking to other writers and, and that it's important if you're a writer to get out of that bubble and just talk to people who aren't writers and, and listen to their stories. And so, so one of our assignments was that we were supposed to go out into town and uh, stop somebody on the street and ask them to tell us something that they had heard that they thought would make a good story, and then use that uh, to write our story for the workshop. We, you sort of go with a buddy from the workshop and, and go out looking for somebody to, to talk to, and people kind of see you coming and kind of hurry away because they don't know exactly what's going on, but, you know, and, and, you know, we're shy and everything. But so I finally, uh, I stopped this guy, and he turned out to be from Ghana. And so I explained the uh, the thing to him, and I'm like, you know, do you know any good stories that you know would make a good seed for a, a piece of fiction? And he sort of thought for a while, and he's like, well, how about how about this? And he told me that kind of in the village where he grew up, there was this tree uh, that he called the spirit tree, and that people believed that this tree was sort of malevolent in a way, and that you should not ever uh, refer to anyone by their name within sort of earshot, so to speak, of <laughs> this tree, because uh, if it knew your name, it could you know, exert malign influence over you. So I was like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's really good. And so I had to, you know, use that in a story. And fortunately, I had just traveled to Africa, you know, the year before. So I, I had some vague idea of, of what the setting should, should be like and stuff. But uh, uh, I've, always, I've always thought that was such a great thing. I never uh, could never track down any other reference to this, this story that this guy had told me, you know, online or anything. But uh, actually, if anyone <laughs> has ever heard of that before, or knows any more details about that, you know, that legend, I would be really curious to, to hear it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was just a great example of sort of proof of concept of, of Orson Scott Card's theory that you can really uh, get some great stories just by talking to people, uh, you know, that everyone's got a story, sort of. I don't have any stories. <laughs> and that was our show. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. If you'd like to share your thoughts about any of the topics we discussed today, we'd love to hear from you. Just go to Tor.com and click on Podcasts, and then Geek's Guide to the Galaxy Episode 21 and post a comment there. And be sure to join us next week when we'll interview George R.R. R. Martin, author of the fantasy novel A Game of Thrones, which is currently being adapted into a TV series by HBO. See you then. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Tor.com. For this episode's show notes, or to subscribe to this podcast, visit Tor.com and click on Podcasts. For more information about your hosts, visit JohnJosephAdams.com or DavidBarrCurrently.com. Music and voiceover produced by Deadspin 9 Entertainment. If you've enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.